Hi, I'm Professor Van Norden, and this is my lecture advice on writing. So we're starting out with a quotation from Thomas Mann, who's a very great German writer, who supposedly said, a writer is someone for whom writing is more difficult than it is for other people. And that doesn't mean that writing can't be fun. I enjoy writing. But it does mean that writing for even really good writers or professional writers is something that requires a lot of thought, both preparation before you start writing and actual effort and then revision after you've got a draft done. So it's worth keeping in mind that writing well doesn't mean writing without effort. It means writing with a lot of effort to perfect what it is that you started to write. So the first piece of advice I have for you is to write for your audience. So think about who is the target audience for this work that I'm writing. One of the difficulties about writing for a class, like our class or any class at college or secondary school for that matter, is you're being typically being given an assignment or a range of possible uh, writing assignments to pick from, and you're writing really for your teacher. So it's a very artificial writing environment. Mm -hmm. My recommendation in this course is that you imagine your audience is an intelligent, sympathetic adult, but one who has not taken this course. So to make it more concrete, you might imagine that your audience for your essay is a parent, a sibling, or maybe a friend who's not at our school. So as you're writing, think, what does this person who hasn't taken our course, what do they need to be told? What information do they need to be given? And the part of the trick of writing is you want to give your audience enough information so that they understand what you're talking about and why you're talking about. But you don't just want to do a dump of all the information you've given. There's a style of essay writing that sometimes gets encouraged in uh, secondary school or high school, where when you write an essay, you write it as if it's an essay final exam, where you just tell the teacher everything you know about the topic, everything you learned in class, just to show you paid attention. You don't wanna write that way. You wanna tell the reader only the things you think your reader knows or needs to know to understand what you're talking about and what they need to know for you to persuade them of whatever you're trying to persuade them. Now, for example, in, in terms of writing for your audience, I write introductions for my essays and conclusions for my own essays that are very different depending upon whether the article is popular uh, or scholarly. This is an article I published in Eon, which is an online magazine. Um, and when you're publishing for for an online source or a popular source, you've got to grab your audience at the very beginning. I've actually written for online sources that'll show you, here's what your article will look like on somebody's phone. And here's how many lines of the article you're going to, they're going to see on the phone. And they're telling you, you've got to grab your reader with those opening lines because it's too easy for them to just swipe away. Uh, also, for online articles, a lot of times the titles are kind of clickbaity, and often online titles are chosen by the editor and not by the original author. So this is a, a kind of oversimplistic title, Western Philosophy is Racist, but it's going to really grab the reader. And my introduction here is also designed to grab the reader immediately. I say mainstream philosophy in the so-called West is narrow-minded, unimaginative, and even xenophobic. I know I'm leveling a serious charge, but how else can we explain the fact that the rich philosophical traditions of China, India, Africa, and the indigenous people of the Americas are completely ignored by almost all philosophy departments in both Europe and the English speaking world? Now I'll stand by all that I've said there, but notice I packed some very exciting claims in the introduction of my essay to grab the reader. In contrast, when I write an academic essay, uh, like this one that appeared in a, uh, an academic journal, I can start out much more slowly. Because if you're interested in reading a review article 
of translations of the Da Xue and the Zhongyu, which are two Chinese classics. If you're interested in reading that, you're going to give me some time to develop my point slowly. So I can say things like, I subscribe to the view that one's depth of understanding of a text is closely related to one's familiarity with the historical debates and dialogues of which it is a part. However, some texts can, to a greater or lesser extent, be pried apart from their particular historical roles. For example, a contemporary undergraduate from any part of the world can read a translation of the Bhagavad Gita or Plato's, the Symposium of Plato and get a lot out of it that is not mere projection, even without learning much about the context of origin or later influence of these works. In contrast, it's hard to get anything at all out of certain works without knowing what meaning they have had for particular historical communities. The Da Xue and the Zhong Yong would be two examples of works. And so I'm finally mentioning the general topic I'm writing about after several sentences. Uh, but that's okay in an academic piece, because as I say, you're not going to start reading this unless you're interested in what I have to say about translations of these works. So you can forgive me to start out in kind of a roundabout way. Now, for our course, and I'd say in general for academic courses, you don't want to try to be too clever in your introduction or your conclusion, because as I say, it's a very artificial environment. You're writing really for a professor on a topic or you chose from a series of topics usually your professor gave you. So if you try to be too clever, it's gonna fall flat probably. So this is what I say in, in one of my works, which I'll uh, talk about in a little bit, techniques for writing better essays. I say introductions and conclusions are actually quite different to write quite difficult to write well. Since they typically summarize the content of the essay, your introduction and conclusion should be the last paragraphs you write. When in doubt, simply use the introduction to give the reader a roadmap of the essay, explaining the thesis that you will be arguing for and the steps you will be taking toward that thesis. Then recapitulate that roadmap in the conclusion. Now, some instructors really don't want you to do this, and so you should write the kind of introduction and conclusion that your particular instructor wants. But I'm telling you that for academic essays, in my experience, if you try to be too clever in writing your introduction, it's going to fall flat. So for me, just give me a simple introduction that introduces the topic and maybe gives me a roadmap and then a simple conclusion that kind of recapitulates where you went. If you're writing for a popular work or a scholarly work, you might do something different, but that's a different context. Now, here's some guides that I think are useful for writing well and for, for usage. Uh, this is The Elements of Style by William Strunk and E.B. White. And originally, this was just a handout that William Strunk Jr., who was an English professor, uh, used with his students. And then one of his students, E.B. White, who became a distinguished author in his own right, remembered it and uh, resurrected it and then added some additional sections and published it. And it's become one of the standard style guides. It does have its critics. It recommends a very simple, very direct style which I, I like, there, but there are some good writers who, who don't agree with all the style guides, but it also has a list of rules of usage which are extremely useful, and I use that as the basis for my own guide, which I'll talk about in a moment. So if you're really serious about writing well, I would recommend, and many other people would recommend, you get a copy of Strunk and White's The Elements of Style. Another valuable guide is the Chicago Manual of Style, which as this uh, picture shows is available now online. And you can access the basic Chicago Manual of Style guide without a subscription, but uh, you can access the complete thing if your institution has a subscription to it and, and Vassar College where we're at does. One of the things that Chicago Manual of Style is very useful for is things like how do you form, format footnotes and how do you format bibliographical entries? And it shows you how to do that for a variety of very different kinds of works. So when I'm publishing 
a book and I, I want to know what's the exact format for a particular kind of citation, I'll look it up in the Chicago Manual of Style. Not all disciplines like the Chicago Manual of Style. So the Chicago Manual of Style is particularly uh, popular um, with you know, some intellectual disciplines like philosophers. If your intellectual discipline wants to use a different one, you know, you use that. But this is one of the guides you can use. And as I say, it's available online. If there's also an, a hard copy, and I have a hard copy because I consult this often enough that it's useful for me to have the hard copy as well. But like I say, Vassar's got a subscription to the complete work, and you can find that via the Vassar library. And if you're watching this video and you're at another institution, um, you can, uh, your institution will probably have a subscription to the Chicago Manual of Style. So in addition, I've got my own guides to writing and correct usage. If you're taking my course here at Vassar, you can find these attached to our online syllabus. But if you're not at Vassar, you can go to my website, brianvannorden.com. And if you look under the pull down mention uh, menu teaching, you'll find a link to guides to writing well and other things. And you can find both of these. So one thing which I cited from earlier in talking about the introduction and conclusions of works is my techniques for writing better essays. And so I recommend that you read this before you start writing your essay for the course. And it will give you good basic advice about composition. In addition, I would at least skim this other work, which again is a basic, my basic rules of punctuation and grammar is available on our online syllabus, but you can also find a copy of it on my website, brianvanorden.com under teaching. And basic rules of punctuation and grammar, it's very detailed. So you're welcome to read it carefully in advance of writing, but for now, I would just skim it for most of you. It starts with the rules you find in Strunk and White's Elements of Style. And then I continue with some other rules that reflect common mistakes that students today often make that aren't identified by Strunk and White. And I expand by giving you examples to illustrate each of the rules from Strunk and White that I cite. So, and when I'm grading your essay, um, I might circle something and just say, see rule one. And that means, take a look at rule one under my basic rules of punctuation and grammar, and that will tell you what you need to fix in this part of your essay or what, what, what I'm telling you you got wrong. Now let's go through and talk about how you might revise a rough draft of your essay, because an important part of writing well is revising what you write. I don't think I've in years written anything, even like a casual letter, you know, responding to a student where I don't proofread it and make a few revisions. So suppose you wrote this rough draft of the opening of your essay. Suppose your essay opens like this. You say Buddhism, of which there are two main branches, may be divided into Theravada and Mahayana. The latter is the kind that's most common in East Asia, and it includes Huayan Buddhism. Huayan Buddhism, which is a kind of Mahayana Buddhism, is known, among other things, for its claim that all is one, which is one of its doctrines. Now, as a, a opening draft, that's not a disaster, but we can make it much better. So let's go through this, and I'll use the rules from my guide to punctuation and usage to illustrate how you could improve this rough draft. Let's start with the opening phrase, which is Buddhism, of which there are two main branches, may be divided into Theravada and Mahayana. One of the most important rules in Strunk and White is Rule 17. And all that Strunk and White's Rule 17 says is omit needless words. And what that means is if you can cut words out of a sentence and express the same meaning, do so. And I think it's a, it's a very valuable rule because one of the most common mistakes 
beginning or college level writers make is there's just too much verbiage in there. And you need to go through and be, you can't be afraid to use that delete key to remove excess verbiage. So how would we apply that to this phrase? Instead of the original, why not just say, Buddhism may be divided into Theravada and Mahayana. Says the same thing, gives you the reader the exact same information, but much more concise. We have omitted needless words. A second thing to keep in mind is, it's often more lively if you use the active voice as opposed to the passive voice. Now, you might not be familiar with the difference between active and passive constructions, but one rule of thumb is, if you could grammatically insert the phrase by zombies into the sentence, you've got yourself a passive construction. So that doesn't mean that the sentence would make sense in terms of content, but if it makes sense grammatically by adding, if you add the phrase by zombies, you got a passive construction there. And you might want to consider an active construction instead. Instead, So Buddhism may be divided by zombies into Theravada and Mahayana. Why are the zombies dividing Buddhism into Theravada and Mahayana? Who knows? They're zombies. But we now we know it's a passive construction. How do we make it active? There are two main branches of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana. Nowhere you could put the phrase by zombies in there and have it make grammatical sense. So that's an active construction. And again, there is sometimes a good reason to use a passive construction, but often the active voice is reads better. Here's another rule. This is rule seven. Rule seven says use a colon after an independent clause to introduce a list of particulars and a positive, an amplification, or an illustrative quotation. That's the phrasing from Strunk and White's original guide, which I reproduce in my rules. And uh, the colon, if you don't know, is that mark of punctuation where it's got like one dot right above another dot. And the way you classically use it is after an independent clause, a complete sentence, you put a colon, and then you give something like a list of things that you're you know, just a list of items or an illustrative quotation. And we could do that right here. We could say, there are two main branches of Buddhism, colon, Theravada, and Mahayana. One rule of thumb is, can you replace the colon with the phrase, that is? So there are two main branches of Buddhism, that is, Theravada and Mahayana. That doesn't mean it would be good to, to stick in the phrase that is there, but if you're trying to understand how to use the colon, you can think of it that way. You don't have to use a colon here. You never have to use a colon if you don't want to. And the original revised sentence with the active voice, there are two main branches of Buddhism, comma, Theravada and Mahayana, is actually fine. But if you want to know how to use a colon, this is what a colon is, this would be how you would use it. So now let's go on to the next phrase. There are two main branches of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana, comma, the latter is the kind that is most common in East Asia. This phrase, these phrases now violate rule five, which is do not join independent clauses by a comma. That's in Strunk and White, and in my rules, I expand that and explain that this mistake is typically called a run-on sentence, or some other usage guys refer to it as a comma splice. So in English, you want to avoid run-on sentences or comma splices, and that's when you have two complete sentences that you've joined with just a comma, and it's considered bad form in English. So how can we fix that? The easiest way, oh, and just, here's just a meme to illustrate this. One does not simply join independent sentences with a comma. Um, so that's just to help you remember that rule. But how could we fix this? Um, you can just put a period in there and start the next sentence with a capital letter. There are two main branches of Buddhism, colon, Theravada, and Mahayana, period. The latter is the kind that is most common in East Asia. That fixes it perfectly. 
There is another way you could fix it. And to understand that, you have to consult rule seven. Rule seven says a semicolon is typically used to separate two complete sentences whose meaning is closely connected. So you could also fix the run-on sentence or the comma splice here with a semicolon. A semicolon is different from a colon, right? We've seen what a colon is. It's one dot on top of another. A semicolon is like a dot or a period with a comma directly underneath it. And it can do different things, but one of the common paradigmatic uses of a semicolon is to separate two complete sentences, but whose meaning is closely corrected. It would be correct here to say, there are two main branches of Buddhism, colon, Theravada and Mahayana, semicolon, the latter is the kind that is most common in East Asia. But, and, and I wanna stress that here, something here, you can lead a full and happy life and never use semicolons. All right, you never you need to use a semicolon. And it's better to not use a semicolon if you're not sure how to use it. This is a paradigmatic use of it, but if you're not sure, just never use a semicolon. So to illustrate this, this is a clip from a, an online guide. It's, it's kind of a guide to writing well, but uh, my daughter introduced me to this. It's a, it's a video that explains to you how to write well by irony, by giving you bad advice about writing, the joke being that you're supposed to see that you're being given that bad advice. So let's just enjoy this together. It's a brief video. This is a selection from a much longer video. Um, let's just enjoy this selection. And keep in mind, it's giving you intentionally bad advice as a joke. When writing, make sure to keep a sharp eye out for pitfalls like punctuation and hormones. Hormones are important. There's no two ways about it. When in doubt, just put semicolons everywhere. Semicolons are for smart people and only smart people. Use them so your audience will think you're smart. Authors don't. Also for kitty feces. Ah, cute with claws and sweet droops. Proofreading is also very important. Always remember to- Can't think of ideas. Come back to this section later before posting. Chaper toi. Stroy content. All right, I, I love that. Um, so the ironic, there's actually several bits of good advice that they've given you ironically here. The first piece of good advice is not to misuse homophones, uh, things that sound the same, but are different words with different meanings. For example, there, there, and there. And here's another meme that illustrates how these words that are pronounced the same are used very differently. There are people who never paid attention to their teacher in school. They're probably wondering what this means. And there's actually a section on my guide to punctuation and usage where I give you examples of homophones that are often confused with one another. And I show you how to, how to use them correctly. So that's one thing to keep in mind. A second good piece of advice that they gave you in a humorous way is remember to proofread what you write before submission. And this is a, apparently an actual case where it's supposed to say preface, but uh, they got it wrong. Why? Because ironically, they didn't proofread carefully enough to catch this obvious mistake. And the thing is, if you write a whole book, I mean, I've published a bunch of books in a complete book, you're gonna make mistakes. No matter how many times you proofread a book, there's gonna be a handful of mistakes in there. But the more you proofread, the fewer mistakes you're gonna make. So remember to proofread your work before submission. Finally, and this is what led me to show you the video in the first place, don't overuse semicolons, right? So ironically, what they said in the video is, when in doubt, just put semicolons everywhere. Semicolons are for smart people and only smart people. Use them so your audience will think you're smart. You do kind of see that sometimes in less experienced writers. They'll throw semicolons in there and you just think, what did you think the semicolon was doing? Again, what it normally does is you use it to separate complete sentences whose meaning is closely related, but you never have to use 
a semicolon. And if you're not sure how to use it, just don't use it. You won't impress a good writer by misusing semicolons. So back to our sample rough draft. So we fix the opening sentence. Uh, there are two main branches of Buddhism, colon, Theravada, and Mahayana. Uh, we got rid of the comma splice. And now we've got the latter is the kind that is most common in East Asia, and it includes Huayan Buddhism. All right, so what's the problem here? Well, it, it's not a terrible uh, revised sentence so far, but if you bring up a new topic, you might want to say something to explain to the reader why you're bringing it up. Again, it's not a fundamental error, but the reader might be wondering, okay, why are we talking about Huayan Buddhism? You could say something just as simple as the latter is the kind that's most common in East Asia. Among the most philosophically influential forms of Mahayana is Hua Yan. So now the reader knows why you're bringing up Hua Yan. It's, oh, it's a very philosophically influential form of Mahayana. Uh, a little better than just bringing it up out of the blue. You can also provide relevant background information. Now, as I suggested earlier, this is tricky because you don't want to just give needless information to your reader just to try to dazzle them with how many facts you know. But if something is relevant to helping your ideal reader understand what you're talking about or why you're talking about it, you might want to put it in there. Again, think of your ideal reader as maybe it's a parent or a sibling or a friend who isn't in our class. What is that person going to want to know, right? What are you going to be telling that particular person so they understand why you're talking about this topic? So you might say um, there are two main branches of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana. Theravada is the form of Buddhism that's most common in Southeast Asia, while Mahayana is most common in East Asia. Among the most philosophically influential forms of Mahayana is Hua Yan. So you've given the reader some background information so they understand why you're throwing these terms Theravada and Mahayana around, what do they mark, um, but you're not overwhelming them with needless information. Next phrase, there are two main branches of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana. Theravada is the form of Buddhism that's most common in Southeast Asia, while Mahayana is most common in East Asia. Among the most philosophically influential forms of Mahayana is Hua Yan. Hua Yan Buddhism, which is a kind of Mahayana Buddhism, is known, among other things, for its claim that all is one, which is one of its doctrines. Maybe you can already guess what the problem is here. That's right, omit needless words. We can take the underlying portion of the paragraph and we can slim that down to Huayan Buddhism is known for its claim that all is one. That's really all the underlined sentence says, so why not condense it down to this? But maybe we can make this sentence even better because we could use the active voice. Huayan Buddhism is known by zombies for its claim that all is one. Apparently it's all the, the rage among zombies to talk about um, Hua Yan Buddhism. Uh, so instead, we could convert this into an active voice. And the easiest way, I think, to convert it to an active voice is to make it a subordinate clause added to the previous sentence. Among the most philosophically influential forms of Mahayana is Hua Yan, which claims that all is one active voice. So very simple, very elegant expresses it in an active way as opposed to being concerned with what the zombies think about anything. So our original opening was this. Buddhism, of which there are two main branches, may be divided into Theravada and Mahayana. The latter is the kind that is common in East Asia and it includes Huayan Buddhism. Huayan Buddhism, which is a kind of Mahayana Buddhism, is known, among other things, for its claim that all is one, which is one of its doctrines. We change that to there are two main branches of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana. Theravada is the form of Buddhism that is most common in Southeast Asia, while Mahayana is most common in East Asia. Among the most philosophically influential forms of Mahayana is Huayan, which claims that all is one. 
It's simpler than our original draft. It gives the reader some useful information to contextualize some of the things that we're saying, but it doesn't overload the reader with verbiage that they don't need uh, or information that's not directly relevant to our topic. Now, earlier on, I was talking about how you write an introductory paragraph, and I said it's often useful to give the reader a roadmap. But we haven't given our, the reader a roadmap in the introductory paragraph so far. We've introduced the topic, but we haven't given them a roadmap. So what would a roadmap look like? Well, like this. There are two main branches of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana. Theravada is the form of Buddhism that's most common in Southeast Asia, while Mahayana is most common in East Asia. Among the most philosophically influential forms of Mahayana is Hua Yan, which claims it all is one. In this essay, I shall explain what this Huayan teaching means and then discuss its ethical implications. So reading this introductory paragraph, I would understand what the topic of the essay is. Even if I hadn't taken the course, I would have a context for understanding what Huayan is and how it fits into larger trends in Buddhism. And I'd have a roadmap of where the essay is going. I'd say, oh, this essay is going to begin by explaining what the Hua Yan teaching that all is one means. And then it's going to go on to talk about the ethical implications of that doctrine. I have a good sense of, of where I'm going. And so I understand what the essay is about and I understand where it's going. By the way, I get asked so often by students can I use the first person singular pronoun I in writing? You absolutely can. Uh, you would think that college writing teachers confer with high school writing teachers about what we're looking for and what we want in writing. We never do. There's no mechanism for doing that. So apparently lots of high school writing teachers and I appreciate what a good job they're doing and how hard their job is, but apparently they're always telling you, don't use I in formal writing. Why not? Now, again, there are certain styles of writing where they'll discourage you from using the first person pronoun. And if your teacher or your discipline tells you to do that, well, then follow the conventions they give you. But usually philosophers like me are happy to have you say, I shall explain and tell me what you're gonna be doing in the essay. Now, one thing to notice is as you're writing, your sentences should be connected to one another. One way to connect sentences is with conjunction. You can say, uh, however, furthermore, in addition. But sentences can also be connected by something as simple as having a word or a concept in common. So what I've done here is I've given our introductory paragraph draft and I've highlighted and color coded the words that connect the sentences to one another. So Theravada and Mahayana occur in the first sentence. Theravada and Mahayana are also in the second sentence. So the reader sees these sentences are connected. The next sentence mentions Mahayana again then it built, brings up a new concept, Hua Yan. Hua Yan is followed up in the next teaching. There should always be some way in which your sentences are connected to one another. Again, it could be as simple as a word in common between them. It can be more explicit, like, as I say, conjunctions, furthermore, therefore, however. But in some way, sentences should flow one from the other. Now, in the last part of the lecture, I want to talk about phrases uh, that I often find in undergraduate essays that will make you sound like a less sophisticated thinker and a less sophisticated writer than you actually are, and how you can fix those things to sound like a more sophisticated writer. But I just want to take a, a moment to note, both in this next part of the lecture and in the earlier part of the lecture, my ultimate goal is to teach you to write in a way that's clear, that gets your message across to your reader, 
and that is ultimately persuasive if you're trying to persuade your reader of something. But some of the stylistic points or formatting points that I'm teaching you, they're, they're really just about pure style. And style is often used for gatekeeping purposes, right? So a, a certain speaking a particular dialect or writing in a particular style can be used to keep people out of intellectual environments or make them less inviting to people. And so obviously that's not what I wanna do, but if you want to get through certain gates that are out there, I will teach you how to get through those gates by learning the codes that will get you through them. Of course, if you don't want to get through the gates or you want to tear down the gates, that's cool too. And I'm, I'm in favor of tearing down the gates too. But uh, I want you to understand some of these format things, they'll make a difference to how your writing is perceived. And if you want to figure out how to get through those gates, I'll show you how to do it. But some of the, again, some of these rules are just matters of clarity, as we'll see. So for example, undergraduates, I often find people saying things like Buddhist morality is based off of their metaphysics. I know what you mean, right? So this isn't a clarity point, but it will sound better if you write Buddhist morality is based on their metaphysics. So don't say based off of, say based on. Another thing I notice is often beginning writers like the word tangible. And tangible literally means touchable, right? And so, uh, but uh, people will say things like, well, the eightfold path of Buddhism provides tangible ethical rules. No, it does not. No list of ethical rules is tangible. I mean, you might have like an actual like stone, like a steely or something that's where you've carved the rules in. So that steely or that, you know, inscription is tangible, but the rules themselves are not tangible. I think what people often mean is specific when they say tangible. So if you're using the word tangible, ask yourself, do I really mean tangible, meaning I can touch it? Or do you mean some other word like specific? Another thing I, I often find in student writing is they'll say things like, Nagasena furthers this with the simile of the candle. Well, why not say instead, Nagasena provides further support for this with the simile of the candle? Now, I know one of our rules is omit needless words, but here the words aren't needless because furthers this used in this way is, is not good style. You want to say Nagasena provides further support for this with the simile of the candle. Uh, students often like the word valid. Uh, valid is a technical term in logic. And I'm happy to go over in office hours exactly what validity is and how it's different from soundness and how it's related to concepts like truth and falsity. But usually when students use the word valid, they don't actually mean valid. And here it's not clear what you mean instead. And so this isn't just a style note, this is like a, a content thing. What are you trying to say when you say a claim is valid? I think often what students mean when they say a claim is valid is they mean, well, it's plausible. And in saying that a claim is plausible, what you mean is, Look, it, it may be true, it may be false, but it's something that rational people could take seriously. That's a plausible claim to make. It, it could very well be true. It deserves to be taken seriously. If you don't mean plausible, that's okay, but pick a better word than valid because valid the way most beginning writers use it is, is just vague. Now I have a, a, wanna have a whole section here on the use of the word whom. So what I find a lot is that the people think that whom is the formal form of who, right? So like if you're in casual writing, you use who, but if you wanna sound sophisticated, you say whom, um, that's not right. Whom is not the formal form of who. In reality, whom is used when it is the grammatical object of a verb 
or preposition. So in other words, do you have a, a preposition, a word like in or on or from acting on the who, then it becomes whom. Or do you have a verb and the direct object of the verb is who, then it becomes whom. In this way, whom corresponds to pronouns like him and her, which also tend to be the, or should be the objects of verbs or prepositions, as opposed to who, which corresponds to pronouns like he or she, which are the, the subject of, of the verb. We'll give some examples to illustrate that in a second. But if you want to understand it, memorize this line from a famous poem by John Donne. John Donne famously says in, in, one, in a poem, therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. So for whom, why whom, because whom is the object of for. Or the quotation from Thomas Mann, Thomas Mann that we opened uh, the lecture with, uh, a writer is somebody for whom writing is particularly difficult. The whom is the object of the preposition in this case, so it's gotta be whom. So if you remember that example, it'll help you use it correctly. But it's also better to simply never use whom rather than use it incorrectly. So it's like semicolons. You can lead a full and happy life and never use a semicolon. You can lead a full and happy life and never use whom. So if you're not sure, just don't use it. Here's an example of a misuse of whom. Glaucon, the person whom is speaking to Socrates, is Plato's brother. That's wrong. All right. Correct is Glaucon, the person who is speaking to Socrates, is Plato's brother. That's correct. Well, when would you use whom? Well, Socrates is the person to whom Glaucon is speaking. So here whom is the object of the preposition to, so that's why we use whom. But it would be acceptable to say Socrates is the person who Glaucon is speaking to. Old school people like me will know, well, that really should be whom technically, but because the two is at the end of the sentence, uh, it's not very glaring. And so you could just say Socrates is the person who Glaucon is speaking to, and 99% of readers are not gonna notice anything wrong with that. So if you're in doubt, just don't use whom at all. Now let's think about the thing I said above about whom corresponding to him or her and who corresponding to he or she, notice, Glaucon, the person who is speaking to Socrates, is Plato's brother, you would say he is speaking to Socrates or she is speaking to Socrates. You wouldn't say him is speaking to Socrates or her is speaking to Socrates. Likewise, Socrates is the person to whom Glaucon is speaking. Glaucon is speaking to him. Glaucon is speaking to her not Glocken is speaking to he or Glocken is speaking to she. So that's why you, you do it that way. But again, you don't ever have to use whom. You don't ever have to use a semicolon if you don't want to. Finally, this is something that I've only started to see recently. Um, and again, it's not a content mistake, but again, it, 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 you know, it's the kind of thing where if you do this in a writing sample for a job or a published work, it may lead to people taking you less seriously than you deserve. And I want you to be taken as seriously as you deserve. So uh, Hamlet suggests stark alternatives to be or not to be. And then I've chosen to, to footnote this and that's a, a nice uh, footnote format there. Everything's fine here. The use of the colon is fine. Uh, the, the footnote is fine, except the location of the number that goes with the footnote. And the number that goes with a footnote is called an index, technically. And a footnote number, there are rare exceptions, but generally the footnote number goes all the way to the right of all other punctuation. So you put that footnote number as far right as you can, and you generally won't go wrong. So where it should be is it should be to the right of the final punctuation, in this case, a period. 
uh, well, it's not the final punctuation, the final period. It should be to the right of the quotation marks. It should be to the right of all the final punctuation, as far right as you could put it. Maybe I'm gesturing left in your vision. But anyway, all the way past all the other words in the sentence, that's where it should be. Uh, in conclusion, here are a few uh, writing rules from George Orwell. Um, who of course is a really great writer. Uh, some of these recapitulate things we've already said. Um, others are, are new. He says, never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech, which you are used to seeing in print. What he means by that is, if you can avoid it, don't use cl cliches. So you might be tempted to say in an essay, well, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I'm not saying that it's always wrong to use a cliche or a common metaphor like that, but isn't there a better way to express your point than using a phrase you've seen used a thousand times before? Never use a long word where a short one will do. Again, if the long word is got exactly the meaning you're looking for, then by all means use it. But simple everyday words will often do the job just fine. And if they will, they're preferable. You're not going to impress a good reader or another good writer by just throwing in big words to try to impress them. If it's possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. Omit needless words. Never use the passive where you can use the active. Can I insert by zombies in the sentence? Well, maybe phrase it in a way so that we leave the zombies out. Never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jar jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. Again, if the foreign word or the scientific term is really the word you mean, that's absolutely fine. But don't use it just to impress your listeners or your readers because a really sophisticated reader won't be impressed by that. And finally, break any of these rules sooner than saying anything outright barbarous. And I love that he ended on that rule because that's really good advice. I give you rules of thumb, but of course, if there's a better way to make your point, violating what would be a good rule of thumb normally, then violate the rule of thumb. But these are, these are pretty good rules of thumb. And the things I say to you in my techniques for writing better essays and in my uh, elementary rules of punctuation and usage, they're pretty good rules to follow most of the time. Since we're mentioning Orwell, I'll just note that he's written a really famous essay. Again, this essay has its detractors, uh, but it's a, it's a terrific thing to read um, if you're interested in writing well, and it's easily available on the internet. You could find it, or if you can't find it, I can send you a PDF of it. So again, I'm Professor Van Norden, and this has been my lecture with advice for writing. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, thank you for listening.